Hello, I'm Pat Kramer. I'm the Senior Director of Case Management, Utilization Management, and Clinical Social Work for the Duke University Health System. And I'm here today to share with you some tips um, that I hope would be helpful if your family member or loved one ends up in the hospital at some point. The agenda for this morning um, will cover patient rights, advocacy and escalating concerns that you might have, healthcare decisions, um, who makes them and, and how are those made, identifying a family spokesperson and why that can be really important, some services that you may want to use when you're in the hospital, such as the chaplain, um, interpreter services, um, and I want you to know about the accessibility services that are available, some words to know that you may find helpful, and then we'll talk about case management and discharge planning. So patient rights to start with, in each room in the hospitals, there is a patient guide. Um, it is, um, uh, specific to each hospital. The one you're looking at here is for Duke Regional Hospital. And inside that patient guide, among lots of other information, is a complete list of the patient's Bill of Rights. There are a couple rights that I want to point out to you that I feel like are really important for you to know uh, right away. You have the right to safe, high-quality medical care without discrimination that's compassionate and respects your personal dignity your beliefs and your values. You have the right to participate in and make decisions about your care, including refusing care, if you want to, uh, within the confines of the law, of course. You have the right to have your illness, your treatment plan, and any alternatives, and any outcomes that are expected explained to you in a way that you can understand. You have the right to a translator if you need one. You have the right to know the names and the roles of the people on the care team. And you have the right to a second opinion. So sometimes, despite how hard we try, um, our, our care may not uh, meet all of your expectations. So um, how do you escalate concerns if you have them? I think it's really important that, that someone be present with the patient um, during the day while they're in the hospital so that there's somebody that the physicians, the nurses, the therapists um, can speak with um, if the patient is not able to um, communicate or maybe even just remember um, everything that's said. So it's helpful to have somebody there to ask questions, to clarify information, uh, take notes, um, and expect to receive answers. Again, if you need to escalate concerns about the care of your loved one, um, you, can, you can ask to see the charge nurse or the nurse manager, um, the supervisor. Um, and if you still feel like you're not heard, you can always request a patient advocate. Each of the hospitals has one, and they will come and listen to your concern, and they will work to resolve it. Now, I have heard people when they come into the hospital say, but it's like crossing into another land. They speak a language here that's different. What do all these words mean? Ask everyone who comes into the room to explain things in not just a language you understand, but actually in words that you understand. Everyone should introduce themselves to you and explain their role. If they don't, ask them and make them explain it to you so that you understand what their role is. Write down the names and the roles of everyone who enters the room in case you have questions or want to make comments at a later date. I will tell you that if you want to make positive comments, those are always appreciated. But I also want to point out that if you have concerns that you want to raise also, either while you're in the hospital or later when you get a survey, those are all addressed as well. So rest assured, if you want to um, communicate with us, we are listening. Know all diet restrictions and, um, and uh, food, any food concerns that your loved one may have before you bring food from outside. It's only natural to want to bring comfort foods to your loved one when they're in the hospital. But they may be scheduled for a procedure, um, so shouldn't have any food to eat. 
or maybe the food that they like the best is exactly what's um, exacerbating their problem, <laughs> and maybe they shouldn't have that food while they're in the hospital. So just be aware of, of those kinds of rules. The other thing that you really need to be aware of now, um, especially because of COVID, are visitor restrictions. And I've seen people get very frustrated and sometimes even angry uh, when they're at the door of the hospital and they're not allowed to come in. So please just know what the current visitor restrictions are. And then the other part of feeling like you're in a strange land is who are all these people? And all of these people pictured here could be members of your loved one's care team. So I'd like to just explain briefly what all of these roles um, do. So the hospitalist is a physician, could be supplemented by a nurse practitioner or a physician uh, assistant, and they see patients only while they're in the hospital. Most of them don't have any kind of private practice. They, they work solely in the hospital. An intensivist is a provider who works in the intensive care unit. Um, they're um, oftentimes pulmonologists. There are some nurse practitioners and physician assistants who work with them also. These people sometimes have a clinic practice, but, but while they're seeing your loved one in the hospital, their role is as the person who, who works solely in the intensive care unit. There are physical and occupational therapists, sometimes called PT and OT. And the physical therapist works with balance and mobility, um, ambulation, strength training, things like that, while the occupational therapist focuses more on um, helping your loved one with activities of daily living, um, bathing, um, maybe teaching them to dress again, um, to uh, toilet independently, um, grooming, things like that. The registered nurse, I think we all know what a nurse does. Um, again, just remember, you know, there's the bedside nurse, patient care nurse, they're called various things. Um, <clears throat> and then there are also, of course, um, managers on the units as well. The nursing assistants, they're sometimes called NAs, and they may refer to themselves as the NA. And they'll come into the room to do vital signs, they help with bathing, um, they may get the, your loved one out of bed um, to a chair or to the bathroom, for example. And they're, um, they're in and out of the room actually quite a bit to check on you. All of those people work generally 12-hour shifts. So if your loved one's in the hospital more than a couple days, you're likely to see more than one um, in any of those roles. But I do want to assure you that communication from shift to shift um, is very um, uh, smooth in our electronic medical record. So you shouldn't have to worry about any kind of um, lack of communication or um, pause in, in the plan of care um, because they've communicated with each other thoroughly. Some other roles that you'll encounter, um, there's a case manager. This is a registered nurse or a master's level social worker who will um, come into the room um, to do an assessment of possible needs that you'll have um, after you leave the hospital. Um, they can help with um, more things, and we're going to talk about that on another slide um, shortly. The palliative care specialist. This is a, a provider, um, frequently a physician, sometimes a nurse practitioner, sometimes a licensed clinical social worker who would come in um, to the room to talk to your loved one and, and you if there is a serious, um, uh, maybe life-threatening illness, not necessarily terminal. Um, and, and they do things like um, they, they focus on pain control, symptom management, um, advanced care planning, uh, which we're going to talk about again in a minute. Um, and so they, they're, they're doing um, uh, things like that to, to um, ameliorate symptoms, if at all possible. The respiratory care therapist. If your loved one's having any kind of breathing problems, you may see a respiratory therapist. And they work with things like ventilators or CPAPs, BiPAPs. If, you, if your loved one has those, you're familiar with them. Um, if they need um, breathing treatments. So that person may come into the room. There are radiology technicians who may come into the room. Certain procedures can be done bedside if your loved one happens to be uh, safer um, having it done in the bed than, than being transported. So you might see them. 
There's a dietitian. This is a healthcare professional who focuses on food and nutrition, and they're gonna make sure that your loved one is on the appropriate diet for their condition, uh, and that they're getting adequate nutrition to support their healing. So healthcare decisions, who makes them? If your family member is alert and oriented, they can make their own decisions. If unable to speak for him or herself for any reason, and that could be that they have just had anesthesia, um, maybe they have dementia, um, maybe they're just unresponsive at this point in time, and there is a designated healthcare power of attorney, sometimes called HCPOA, that individual speaks for the patient. Why are advanced directives important? I can't emphasize this um, enough. When an individual names a healthcare power of attorney and or creates a living will, they take the opportunity while they're able to convey their wishes to make the decisions um, that, that someone else would have to make for them if they haven't done this. So it's really important that they take that opportunity before they're in the hospital to make their wishes known. The, I really encourage you to take advantage of, of uh, not being in the hospital and taking care of this while your family members are well. It can be more difficult to execute these documents when the patient is in the hospital due to state laws that forbid family members and hospital employees from witnessing these documents, and they take two witnesses. Um, this doesn't mean that you should not ask about these documents, though, while you're in the hospital and efforts can be made to help you secure other witnesses. Sometimes though, it's, it's as, you know, as complicated as going next door to ask um, visitors of another patient to come in and witness though, and sometimes that can be really uncomfortable. So again, I really um, urge you to take care of this before you come into the hospital. Why is it important to identify a family spokesperson? <clears throat> you know, if, if the family is a large one, and if, you're, um, if you've taken my advice that I gave you earlier and asked for, for help having people come into the hospital to sit with your loved one, um, physicians, case managers, therapists are talking to the person in the room possibly, and if they're not the spokesperson, um, they may not feel that they have the responsibility to share the information they've heard, um, they may not be taking notes, um, and and they may be looked to to make decisions that maybe they shouldn't be making. So if you appoint a family spokesperson, that can prevent confusion and miscommunication for the doctors, the other members of the care team, and any staff responsible for taking care of your loved one. So I really urge you, again, if, if, if there's anybody besides just you, and I hope there is, in the room, um, you want to make sure that the family spokesperson's been identified. So while you're in the hospital, um, there, may, there are some services that you might want to take advantage of. So hospital chaplains provide care for people of all faiths. They're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They provide support and guidance and just someone to listen um, to you or your loved one when you're under stress. Um, maybe when you have important decisions to make, um, maybe you have ethical questions, um, or maybe you just want someone to pray with you. Um, the chaplains also maintain a list of community clergy who are willing to come into the hospital from many faith traditions. Interpreter Services provides, free of charge, translation services, um, generally by phone or video under under certain circumstances, they can be uh, provided in person if it's, if it's necessary. Um, I would caution you though, if you can, if you can use the phone or the video, uh, it will be more timely. Sometimes if we have to get a person to come in, um, there can actually be delays in care. Accessibility services include accessible parking, braille, and large print materials, um, service animals, American Sign Language, or ASL interpretation, and TDD. So all of these are available to you. I wanna talk for a second about Duke MyChart. Um, Duke MyChart's an electronic medical record portal 
um, that provides uh, personalized and safe, secure online access um, to portions of your medical record. With Duke My Chart, you can make appointments, you can send emails to your doctor, uh, you can pay bills, uh, you can participate in video visits, and those can come in really handy. Um, when your loved one first gets home from the hospital and it's hard to get them um, into the car, perhaps. Um, and you can just send a message to your doctor's office when you have non-urgent needs. So if you would like to sign up for Duke My Chart, you can call the numbers that you see on the slide um, and they'll send an authentic authentication code um, and you can um, activate your account. Um, you can also sign up for Duke My Chart at www.dukemychart.org um, and you can also ask the next time you go in to see your provider. So I want to talk for a minute about case management and discharge planning. So discharge planning is available to every patient uh, and a case manager is most likely to come see you um, without you asking um, and will do an assessment to help decide what care needs your loved ones may have after discharge from the hospital. If, if a case manager doesn't come, um, all you have to do is ask, um, and every single patient is, um, will be provided with, with case management services. Some of the services that a case manager can help you with are clarifying insurance benefits. If you have commercial insurance or one of the managed Medicare products, for example, um, sometimes this can get pretty complicated, so they can help you clarify what benefits you have. They can help with post-acute, which means after discharge um, placements, um, if those are needed. Um, maybe, and we're gonna talk more about what all those options are, but you know, does your loved one need to go to a skilled nursing facility temporarily? Uh, do they, um, are they gonna go home with home health um, or hospice? Um, do you need community resources? Uh, do you need help setting up transportation? A case manager can also advise you on applying for Medicaid or Social Security Disability. So to help with this discharge planning, um, I have some words I want you to know um, that explain the levels of post-acute care that are available. Remember, post-acute care is after discharge from a hospital. So skilled nursing facility, sometimes called a SNF, and you'll hear it referred to that way, that is uh, short-term placement in a skilled nursing facility for physical therapy, um, maybe IV antibiotics, um, some wound care. Um, stays in a skilled nursing facility generally are going to be under 20 days. Um, they could be longer, but um, that's probably about the usual. Um, assisted living. Um, generally, these are private pay facilities that offer um, a room and board um, generally, they have a nice dining room of some sort, um, and they can provide help with activities of daily living. Under some limited circumstances, Medicaid um, does pay for assisted living in some facilities. Acute or inpatient rehab, those words are used um, interchangeably, could be either one. Um, this is a higher level of rehabilitation than provided in skilled nursing facilities. And by higher level, I mean it's more intense. Um, so your patient must be able to tolerate more. They need to be able to do three hours a day of multiple therapies. So if they need physical therapy and occupational therapy, maybe, maybe physical therapy and speech, um, they would go possibly to an acute or an inpatient rehab. An LTAC, L-T-A-C-H, that's long-term acute care hospital. We do discharge patients sometimes to an LTAC. These are patients who require um, vent weaning, for example. They're on a ventilator and we know that they can come off the ventilator, uh, but they're gonna need some extra time to do that. Um, they have complicated wound care um, that's expected to take longer than what would happen in a, nursing, a, a skilled nursing facility. Um, they have um, excessive rehab needs um, but maybe aren't up to the three hours a day yet of being able to tolerate therapy. They would go to an LTAC. Um, dementia care, those are secure units for individuals with serious memory loss. Uh, they may be in a nursing home, they may be in an assisted living. Hospice provides end of life care. 
that of course is focused on quality of life and pain management. And home health is intermittent nursing and therapy provided in the home. Intermittent is an important word in that sentence um, and it means the person is not there all the time. So this is like not having somebody come into your home and stay. The nurse comes in, they do their, their excellent work, and then they leave. Same with the therapist. Palliative care, I feel like we've talked about that kind of already. Um, these are for, um, for individuals with serious illness. It focuses on symptom uh, relief and improving quality of life. Activities of daily living, ADLs, again, I think we've talked about that a couple times. Bathing, dressing, eating, toileting, um, continence, transferring. Um, advanced care planning, sometimes referred to as ACP. Um, again, the palliative care um, provider would possibly talk to you about that. 24 hour or around the clock care, if someone tells you that's what your patient needs, um, this means that the person needs someone with them all day and all night. Um, someone who's going to be able to respond at any time of the day or night. Um, sliding scale, that's just, those are, that's an expression, I guess, that, that just means that the cost of the services um, is based on your income. So at discharge, please make sure that you are clear on all discharge instructions. Repeat them back in your own words to the nurse. Um, ask for clarity if you don't understand something. Um, do you have all your prescriptions? And if you want, there are, um, in two of the hospitals, uh, two of the Duke hospitals, there are inpatient, uh, outpatient, I'm sorry, pharmacies that will um, be able to fill your prescriptions if you're interested uh, so that you have them before you go home. When are your follow-up appointments? Did you make them or did someone make them for you? And if someone made them for you, are they a date and time that you can actually make? And then do you need help getting to those? So do you need to set up some kind of transportation assistance? Again, just to remind you, sign up for Duke My Chart. I think you'll find it very helpful. Um, try to have all the supplies you'll need for the first week at home. And to accomplish that, you might look at the next bullet, accept help. If friends and family offer meals, transportation, um, grocery shopping, and so forth, accept their offers. Generally, people who offer to help want to help. Um, it makes them feel good. Please take advantage of it. Um, and then if you've taken advantage of the offers, then try to find some time for self-care. This is critical also. Um, as, as a caregiver, you know that. Uh, and I know there are some other topics um, in this conference that will address um, self-care also and, and resources um, that will help you. Um, I do want to let you know that you'll likely get a follow-up phone call when you leave the hospital. Um, and these um, calls are made by people who are trained to ask specific questions to make sure that you have the prescriptions you need, that you understood your discharge instructions, that you have your appointments, uh, or they can help you make them, um, that you have transportation, or they can help you get that. Um, so please, when you see that call come, um, answer it. Um, because they're very helpful and they're trained um, to make sure that, that the discharge plan created for you um, actually is going to be able to be carried out. So thank you very much for your time today. Um, I appreciate your attention and I hope you found some of these tips to be helpful. Thank you.